sat down to eat, and I asked Clayton, our grandson, Jason's son, if he would read what the paper said. All the papers said the same thing. So he read it to us, but they were all addressed to us individually. <clears throat> And as I read this, keep in mind, we did not know what was going to be happening, happening 24 hours later. Mom, this tree has potential. It could grow to 60 feet and give hundreds of animals and birds shelter. It could be your Christmas tree in 10 years. It could be planted in a pot and give you joy as you tend it and watch it grow. It may just put a smile on your face. Christ has put potential in you, potential that you may not, yet be real, may not yet be realized. When I turned 13, my parents bought a real Christmas tree that we planted outside when the season came to an end. That tree did not live long, but it served its purpose in helping us celebrate Christ's birthday that year as a family. How much more important are you to God than that tree was to us? You have potential to be used by God in so many ways that the mind cannot conceive. Throughout this coming year, I will be praying that you will continue to discover the potential God has put in you. Merry Christmas, Jason. So it was a powerful moment when Clayton read this, but then a day and a half later when we got this news, I went to that little red paper and I read it again and again. And I said to Jerry, it's almost as if Jason were writing his prophecy, what was going to be happening very soon to, to him and his family. Their own potential was going to be tapped in a way that they probably never would have dreamed of. Um, and so now they are this sheltering tree for this family of three additional children. And I had to think of the verse in John 14 that says, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's saying, I need to leave, I'm going back to my father, but I am not gonna let you as orphans. I'm not gonna let you as orphans, I will send the Holy Spirit. And he's going to be in you, he's gonna be living in you, and because of that, you're going to be able to tap into that potential that Jesus has placed in you, and you will be able to live into God's faithfulness. And I think, Jerry, you have something you want to add to this, too. Um, <clears throat> before we do that, <clears throat> I'm going to read something from Psalm. <clears throat> uh, we could, could we have our memory verse? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I... We can do it later, too. We can do it later. We'll do it later. We'll do it later. Okay. Um, Segwaying into, I, I have some, something from Psalm 66, but I did not know what Dale was going to be preaching on this morning. And I oftentimes go to the, a couple times go to the gym um, in the morning, early in the morning. And uh, I, I usually run on a treadmill for some time and, and I use that time to pray. And I prayed, <clears throat> excuse me, I prayed Wednesday morning. I said, uh, Lord, I, I'm not sure what I should share. Uh, give, me a, give me something from your word to share. And immediately, Psalm 66 came to my mind. I had no idea what Psalm 66 was. And I did not, not, not know what Dale was going to be preaching. So I got home, and I usually take some time, a half hour reading after I get home from the gym. And uh, so I looked up what Psalm 66 was. And uh, I said to Jean, do you have any idea what Dale's gonna be preaching about? She said, yeah, he's gonna be preaching on Acts 27, uh, which is a shipwreck of Paul. I said, wow. So these are the words from Psalm 66. This Psalm was written at the time when the Israelites were in Babylon um, and, and uh, God was talking to them uh, about going back to Jerusalem. And in fact, it was kind of from our lesson this morning that we talked about. It even says about, uh, about the Israelites not being allowed to raise their heads, which comes through in this, uh, this uh, 
this, these couple verses. So I'm going to read Psalm 66, verses 8 through 12. Praise our God, O peoples. Let the sound of praise be heard. He preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our necks. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, and you brought us back to a place of abundance. So he's talking about how the Israelites were down and how, uh, how the burdens were upon them. And I think there are burdens in our lives, too. I mean, we weather the storms, uh, but he refines us like silver and brings us back. And then the very, sa- very last says, you brought us back to a place of abundance, which he often, which he always does. He brings us back to that place of abundance. Mm-hmm. So join me in prayer as we pray this morning. Lord, we come before you, thanking you for your blessing upon us, allowing us to be here this morning. We thank you that your spirit is among us, that we can just worship you, Lord. And we praise your holy holy name. And no matter what we are going through, that you will walk walk with us through fire, through water. And sometimes you even carry us, Lord. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for this. Lord, we remember those this morning that have lost loved ones recently. We grieve for their loss, but we rejoice that they are with you eternally. And Lord, we pray for those who are ill, who are recuperating from surgery, and we just ask your blessing upon them and ask your healing upon them. Lord, we also pray for those who are involved in the process of the involvement of the process, uh, involvement with Metzler and Alive Church, for Lloyd Hoover and Brian Martin, and the leadership of both Metzler and Alive, we ask that you would give them discernment and wisdom in this process. Lord, we also pray for our missionaries, for the Estimas in Haiti and the Martinezes in Uruguay, and Andrea, who is leaving for the Middle East. We ask your blessing upon her and Austin, who uh, is working in YWAM. We pray for those who are responsible for next Sunday service. Mm -hmm. Uh, For Brian, as he brings a sermon for the worship team, as uh, as we lift up our our, uh, voices in praise. We We thank you for the monies that will be received this morning, the offerings, that you may use these monies to your honor and glory. We pray for Dale this morning as he brings us your message. Lord, what you want us to hear. Mm-hmm. And we pray, <clears throat> we pray that you would have our ears open, that we may hear your message that you, you want for us. And we pray that you would accept our worship this morning as we lift up our voices in song. Mm-hmm. We thank you for Dawn for doing this and for leading us. Mm-hmm. We just pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand as we worship together this morning. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship and a 
it's all about you all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i've made it when it's all about you it's all about you jesus king of endless worth no one could express how much you deserve much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i've made it when it's all about you it's all about you jesus amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believe my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. has promised good to me is where my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my chains are gone i've been set free my God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever mine upon the waters the great unknown where feet may fail and there I find 
found you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will stand and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace I am yours, you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your in hand will be my guide. Feet may fail and fear surrounds me. You never fail, and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper where my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior spirit lead me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander my faith will be me stronger in the presence of my savior spirit lead me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves my soul will rest in your embrace I am yours and you are You may all be seated. Thank you. Well, good morning. I believe you got the volume on here, okay? Um, I don't think anybody was praying for a bigger snowstorm than I was this morning. How'd that work out? Well, let me, let me uh, give you a little bit of an apology, because if you came here expecting a Valentine's sermon, you're not going to get it. Um, Jim asked me to share probably about two months ago, and... Uh, Two days later, I was reading in the, in the book of Acts 27, and God seemed to say that this is, this is where I want you to go. And uh, 
At that point, I wasn't even sure I was preaching because I hadn't said yes yet. And, uh, and I wasn't sure what day it was going to be, except that it was going to be in February. And uh, I didn't think I wanted to preach today because it was February 13th. And that's Valentine's Day, and it's Super Bowl Sunday, and there's all kinds of stuff going on. And I, I just thought, this, uh, I don't want the 13th. My wife, my dear wife, kept telling me to take the 13th. And I've learned through the years uh, that there's some things that I trust her on, and so I, I agreed to take the 13th, and uh, I'll share a little bit later why that is uh, kind of interesting. My theme is weathering storms. I'm going to take a detour, though, because I'm not a pastor. I'm a businessman, okay? So I'm going to, I'm going to start out in the business world and uh, see if we can get this to go. Maybe we can't. There. All right. That's a horse. Um, many years ago, it must be close to 40 years ago. Um, I was introduced to something with a horse like this. I don't know well, it wasn't the same horse, but it looked like this. And that was, uh, we had a professor come down out of Penn State, and uh, he introduced us to something called continuous improvement. One of the things that I've enjoyed in business through the years is learning uh, things about business, but also looking for parallels to biblical concepts. And they're very common when you get into leadership issues, teamwork issues, and uh, even, even business in general. There's a lot of laws that come out of Scripture. And they often are, are, are uh, sold as the, the, the latest, greatest rage, right? Uh, lots of leadership gurus uh, came from a, a biblical background, like John Maxwell, who was a pastor first. Okay, so this horse was my introduction to something called continuous improvement. And the way this was introduced, and you'll have to pardon me if this is too crude, but I, I, I think it works, the way this was introduced was that the horse was uh, a process, okay? And, and what this professor told us was that business makes a big mistake because we have quality control departments, and in, the, in those departments, we sit at the back of the horse, and we check the output, okay? And, and we determine, is the output good or is the output bad? And the whole point that he was trying to make is we need to move around to the front end of the horse and make sure we have good input. There could almost be a, a, a scriptural parallel there, couldn't it? Inputs are important. Well, here's some of the terms that we use in business. TQM, total quality management, just in time, uh, continuous improvement, lean manufacturing, uh, plan, do, check, act, lots of acronyms. These are some of the, that have been uh, used over the years. And, and, the sec and I'll, this has nothing to do with the sermon. I'll just throw this in. The second one, just in time, is why you can't buy anything in stores today. For the last 40 years, we've told everybody that you don't want any inventory, right? You don't want any inventory. Everything has to arrive exactly when you need it. And what happens if you're a manufacturer and you're getting stuff from all over the world, and all of a sudden something doesn't arrive on time? You can't make what you want to make. So we've got trucks sitting around with no microchips and parking lots and so forth. So that's, that's a freebie. I just threw that in. But that, that's been trained into our business mindset for 40 years. You do not have inventory. And nowhere did they, did they really plan on a pandemic affecting that, did they? All right, so here's a, a principle from the Toyota way. Toyota TPS, the Toyota production system, is something that's been studied extensively. But I want you to think about, think about this and say, what, what, how could you change this in very small ways and have a, a spiritual impact? Base your management decisions on a long-term philosophy, even at the expense of short-term financial goals. What if we would say, Base your life decisions on an eternal philosophy, even at the expense of short-term pleasure, okay? What would our decisions look like? Here's another one. Respect your extended network of partners and suppliers by challenging them and helping them to improve. What if we did that as people of God? What if we would challenge each other and help, help each other improve rather than uh, cut each other down? Another one. Become a learning organization through relentless reflection and continuous improvement. What if we'd say... Become a learning church through relentless Bible study and continuous prayer. How would that look? This is the one I really like. Grow leaders who thoroughly understand the work, live the philosophy, and teach to others. What if we grew leaders who thoroughly understood the word, lived their faith, and taught it to others? 
That would be called disciple making, right? So you can see these parallels. Well, in the, on the personal level, we're also involved in continuous improvement, aren't we? Uh, it, it's called New Year's Day, right? We make resolutions. And these are the top 10 from uh, 2020. And you can see exercise more, lose weight. Every one of these has to do with us improving in some way, okay? So we have this desire to improve as people. It's in a business world, it's in this world. If you look at the, uh, the top selling book categories, number one is romance, because we all wanna be loved, right? The second one is a thriller. The third one is religion and self-help. I think it's interesting that those two get put together, religion and self-help. But this morning, we're gonna look at Acts 27, and Acts 27 fits in the category of a thriller. Okay, if you're on that boat, you're on a thriller, all right? Sometimes we read these, uh, these texts and we kind of kind of fly through them without thinking about it. But, but this is uh, on the personal level. Well, what about, what about on the spiritual level? On the spiritual level, we talk about something called sanctification. We talk about justification. We talk about sanctification. And, and it refers to the state or the process, there's that word again, process, of being made holy as a vessel full of the Holy Spirit. I've heard this talked about all my life. And when I looked at this definition, it struck me that not very often have I heard it described as being full of the Holy Spirit of God. I've heard a lot about being made holy. Second Thessalonians is on, your, on the screen here, but uh, Paul writes, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit through the belief in the truth. Here it gives this impression that there's a process going on, isn't there? All right, hold that thought. Get my right slide here. I'm not very good at giving answers. So I've always said I, I've, I've been promoted in business because I was willing to ask questions that other people weren't willing to ask sometimes. But I'm not very good with answers because I'm not smart enough for that. But I, but I do like to ask questions. I'm kind of curious. And so this morning I have a goal. And it's not to tell you anything but it's to leave you with two questions. And here's the first one. Who's your pilot? Who's your pilot? Um, we're going to read from Acts 9, or Acts 27. I'm going to start at verse 9. But this is, a, this is an interesting story because, because Paul ha is on his way to, uh, to Rome. And it's not a, uh, it's not a, a, a joy ride. He's a prisoner. The last seven chapters of Acts deal with uh, the end of, of the story here with, with Paul. And a good bit of it has to do with his journey to Rome. And so they've been sailing along, uh, along you can see the, the, the route here up on the, on the map. And they've been sailing along, they've jumped ships a couple of times. The first uh, eight verses of chapter 27 talk about this. And uh, they finally find a ship, and they want to, uh, to move on. And so I wanna I'm going to start reading at verse 9, because that's the part I want to focus on. Um, and before we do that, I want to pray. So let's pray. God, we are extremely grateful for your word to us. It, it, is, uh, it is life, and it is your love letter. And help us to, uh, this morning to hear from it, because what you speak is truth. And whatever I speak... May you blow away if it's chaff. We want to hear from you. We're going to be guided by your spirit. Thank you for being here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so I'm going to begin at verse 9 in Acts chapter 27. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, men... I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives as well, as well also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, fo followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. So they weighed anchor, sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm, 
and could not head into the wind. So we gave into it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some, some island. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea, when about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found that it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that they would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food you need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he had said this, he took some bread, gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they let them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The boat stuck fast and would not move. The stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first to get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on any other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Now that sounds like a happy ever after ending, except that it's not the end. So, kind of a long story. And I'm not going to, there's a lot of places you could go with this and I'm not going to go, but I want us to just think about how do we react in storms? How do we react in storms? We're all in storms. We're in, you know, I've, always, I've heard it said you're either leaving one, you're going into one, or you're in one. I don't know what you prefer, but that's probably the reality. And so here we have this story, and, and at the beginning of it, I think there's, a, there's some cautions that we can take out of the first few verses, verses 9 through 12. I'm going to back up to those and just put these, uh, put these points up here. You know, we have an expert who's a pilot, and we've got an owner of a ship, and his, his goal is to make money off the ship. And then we've got a group of prisoners, and we've got a, a soldiers, and we've got sailors. These guys are all 276 of them. It's a pretty big size, pretty good sized boat. And uh, the first thing that we see is the experts, who are the pilot and the owner probably, they say sail on. And Paul says that's a mistake. Okay? If there's one thing that we've learned in the past year amidst the pandemic is that experts don't always agree, do they? We've got a lot of experts who disagree. Okay? So... Just a word of advice, we need experts, but be careful whose advice you listen to. The second one is, the majority is not always right. The majority on this ship said, let's sail, right? We like to have the majority. I remember years ago, we had something called the moral majority, and I always questioned it because I always thought the Bible teaches that we're not going to be in the majority. As Christians, we're not going to be in the majority. So I always had a little bit of trouble with that, with that very phrasing, but the majority is not always right. That's the second one. The third one is, beware of favorable circumstances alone. 
I get nervous when I hear somebody say that it feels so right that it must be a God thing. Whoa. It may feel so right because it's temptation. We, <laughs> feelings alone and circumstances alone are not proof positive that's a good decision to make. So um, I remember back in the 90s, Dave Ness was our pastor, and I remember something he taught. I haven't forgotten it. He taught that there was four things. He referred to them as buoys in the water that when they line up, you can move ahead. One of them was circumstances, but it was just one of them. The other three were the word of God, the still small voice, and the counsel of godly people. Okay? He said when you line up all four of those, you can move ahead with confidence. Okay? So I think, I think there's a word there that um, can be beneficial to us because storms come from a lot of different places. Some of them are self-inflicted, aren't they? We make bad decisions that get us into storms. God wants to help us avoid them, okay? Other storms we have no control over, and sometimes we get drug into a storm because of other people's bad decisions, right? Paul, here. His, his, his idea was don't sail, and uh, the rest of them said let's sail. All right, so let's jump into the storm. This is a bad storm. And uh, for those of you who have never sailed, I can tell you that sailing into the wind's a trick. I learned this when I was like 16 years old, 17, I don't know. I was up at Lake Wall and Popek with a youth retreat. Two of us decided to run the sailboat out into the water. It was a little two-pontoon sailboat. It was a little thing. The only problem was neither one of us had ever sailed. We had a brisk wind from the shore dry, going towards the other shore. And so we sailed out on the lake, and we got out there fairly far. And it dawned on us that we probably need to figure out how to get back. And uh, so we thought, well, neither of us had sailed. We thought, we well, got to zigzag. There's something about zigzagging, and you, you got to keep the wind in the sail. And so, so we started to zigzag, and, and we, we did that so half. The only problem was we kept going away from land. And so fortunately, we had our own version of a lifeboat along. We had an oar. Only one, mind you. And so... Um, we started, we, we dropped the sail. We couldn't figure it out. And we said, we, you know, we got to get back for breakfast. We better start paddling now. So we dropped the sail, and we started rowing back to shore. You don't want to sail with me. That's the last time I sailed. But the, the, the really humbling part about it was, I don't know, we probably got halfway back. There were two young girls in a sailboat that came out and sailed circles around us. <laughs> and they were really having a good time. And uh, they didn't help us at all. And we ended up rowing the whole way back to shore. So you don't want to sail with me. But they're trying to sail into this northeast, northeast wind. And they're on the south side of the island in the middle of the, uh, the map that was there previously. They're on the south side of that island. The northeast wind's taking you away from that island. If it's a strong enough wind, I don't think it probably matters how good of a sailor you are. You're going to go with the wind. And they finally gave up. And they started to go with the wind. And they started to throw stuff overboard. Um, you get down to verse 20. And they are in a hopeless situation, right? What happens when we reach hopelessness? It's a really bad feeling, isn't it? Um, I was watching a uh, video about a week ago. came through from Right Now Media. It was a, uh, a new, new release, and it was Louis Giglio. And I listened to part of it, and this is the whole thing, but, but he made this comment, and I wrote it down really quickly because I was thinking about that popped into my head for today. He said, we are not ready for God to do great things until we are in a state of hopelessness. Otherwise, we quickly revert to doing things our way. Kind of a sad statement about us human beings, right? But it's pretty true, isn't it? God often doesn't show up until we've kind of given up. Uh, Paul comes back onto the scene then. And uh, he, uh, he tells them to take courage. And I love the way he describes himself. He says, the God who I belong, the God who I, and I think in some versions it says the God whose I am, and some it says the God who I belong to and the God whom I serve. It's interesting to me that both those pieces exist. And he states the God who I belong to first. Who do we belong to? Who do we belong to? You know, I hear us talk a lot about serving God. But what about who do we belong to? I so appreciated Dawn's uh, last song. Um, the God whose I am, right? It's who I am. 
in Jesus, in God. Uh, we don't, we tend to, we tend to slide away from that, but Paul brings that right in and says, God, who's I am, and he reminds them that they ignored him. Now, I don't think he did that arrogantly. I think he did that to gain credibility, to remind them that, hey, if you had listened to me, we wouldn't be in this mess. And then he says, um, but here's, here's what the angel of the Lord re- revealed to me, and he said, uh, I'm going to give you these people on this ship. I'm giving you their lives because you must appeal you must appear before Caesar. Interesting, in Acts 23, 11, it also states that you must appear before Caesar. I wonder what Paul was thinking during those 14 days at sea when the ship was in danger of being knocked apart. I don't know. What was he doing? 14 days. It, he obviously didn't panic, did he? Well, I don't know. Maybe within the days he did, and we don't know it. But, but at, at some point here, Paul, who is a prisoner becomes the captain of the ship, doesn't he? Because he's gained some favor, apparently, with Julius, who's a centurion. Julius, back in verse 3, allowed his friends to take care of some of his needs. Somehow, there was a relationship being built a little bit between the, the centurion, who was the head of the guard, who was captain uh, of the ship, making sure they get where they're supposed to get, which is Rome. And, uh, and so here... Um, he gains his favor, and, and he takes over the ship. And so he tells them not to panic, and, and, and they, go, they, they sail on 14th day. They're still sailing this thing, and they're still out in the middle of nowhere, and they sense they're getting close to an island. And uh, Paul says, hey, guys, it's time for breakfast. I bet they weren't very hungry. So Paul ate first, right? He gave thanks first. He asked a blessing right in front of them, 276. And then he ate, and the rest were encouraged, and they ate also. He said, you're going to need it. We gotta get to shore, we're gonna lose this ship. And so uh, there's a few, a few sailors uh, who have an easy way out of this mess. It's called a lifeboat. And so they lower the lifeboat. This is dark, this happens at midnight. They lower the lifeboat and, and Paul sees it and he says, unless you don't do that, we can't be saved, you can't be saved. And so the centurion gives orders to cut the ropes and let the lifeboat fall away. I wonder what the people were thinking who were going to get in that lifeboat. It's like, you just cut away our chance for survival. That's the way our human brains work, aren't, doesn't it? I mean, we, we, we're looking for ways out of storms. They cut it away. It's gone. And they, run ag- and they run aground. Well, daylight comes. They see it's a, a, a bay with a sandy beach. Isn't that interesting? You know the island of Malta is very rocky coastline? It has a few bays. God put them in that bay, didn't he? And so they run the ship aground, and it says everybody gets on shore. And it sounds like a happy ever after ending, and we know it's not. Because Saul's still, Paul's still a prisoner. And he goes onto the island, gets bitten by a snake. They think he's a really bad criminal. He's going to die from it. He doesn't. He overcomes it. Then they think he's a god. Everybody bring people to him to heal. He heals uh, Publius, I believe it's Publius, the guy's name, has a servant or somebody that's sick, and he heals them. The island of Malta became the first Roman colony to convert to Christianity. Today there's a bay there called the Bay of St. Paul. See, God had a plan for Paul even in the middle of that storm. So how does this work in real life? Um, I wasn't going to, I didn't think I was going to go here because I've shared some of this before, but with some of you, anyway. But I kept coming back to what happened to me a few years ago when I lost my job. And it just so happens that I lost my job seven years ago. I had that job for 36 years plus. I knew what I was doing. I was completely comfortable. I had a, making a good living. And things were really good, right? But the last few years, things weren't so good. We, were, we had hit some rough waters as a company, and there was a lot going on. And so on February 13th, I lost my job. You know what today is? It amazes me how God works little details out in our lives. You know, we, we think of God as being doing big things, but God does little things. And that's amazing when you think about it in millions of people all over the world who are following God, and right now, at this minute, God's doing stuff. 
How big's our God? So I remember going home on that Friday. I walked in the house. Sharon was sitting there. I had been told about four weeks before that that I would be losing my job, but I, I didn't. They told me that they'd try and find another job for me. And so I didn't know what was going to happen until that Friday. And so I, went, I walked in. I did not, uh, I did not, they, didn't have, they didn't have another job for me. So I went home that Friday night, walked in, Sharon's sitting there. And I said, well, honey, this year for Valentine's Day, you got a lot more man and a lot less money. Um, but God had prepared me for that moment a year and two weeks earlier. Okay? January 30th, 2014, I'd been asked to go to the parent company to run a new part of the, a different part of the company. And the company had had, I mean, that department had had a lot of problems. We tried to implement a new ERP system and it had, it had failed. And so we, uh, I was asked to take that job. And so I, uh, I uh, had to decide within a day, two days. Basically, they asked to meet with me the next day. So two of the owners and I met the following day. But the, the morning of that, it was January 31st. Now during this time, Please understand that I was not super spiritual. In fact, I was kind of obsessed with work. We were trying to keep this thing afloat. And so the one thing I continued to do, though, was to have my morning devotions. And so that, that morning, the 31st, I get up. Typically, I have them alone. And uh, the passage I was reading from was Moses four, or, uh, Exodus 4, about Moses and the burning bush. And, and in that passage, in chapter 4, Moses is arguing with God about doing God's asking him to do. And I, I have to tell you, it was one of the most unique experiences I've had, but I was basically in the story. And I knew what God was saying was, Dale, you don't want to go because you're afraid of this. And, I, and, I, and it was so convicting. I should say that when I told Sharon what they had asked me to do, I, I was hoping Sharon would say, don't go. Because I'm not going along. She didn't. She said, it's your decision. You've got to do what God wants you to do. That's not what you want to hear at that moment. I wanted her to say, don't go. Okay, so that morning, I read this, and I came under incredible conviction that I had to get past this fear I had of going, and that God was, was wanting me to go. I went to the meeting, 11 o'clock that day. We, I met with two of the owners, and uh, they told me about the job and what they wanted me to do, and, and I was prepared to say, yes, Sharon knows this, because when I left for work, I went in, and I said, you need to read Exodus 4, you need to know that I'm really under conviction about this. I, I'm, I'm sensing something, and I knew she would know what I was sensing if she read that. And so I uh, had the meeting. Went back to my desk, tried to do a little work. Wasn't easy. I thought I got much done. But I was sitting there about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and suddenly, God spoke to me in one of the most real ways I've ever experienced. And it was a story of Abraham and Isaac. Anybody remember what Jeff preached on last Sunday? Genesis 22, the story of Abraham and Isaac. And as I sat at my desk, I don't think it was audible, but it was to me. God said, you were willing, don't go. It was that clear. You were willing, don't go. And so I... Uh, I sat there for a while, and I, I meditated on this a little bit. The message seemed clear. I was completely at peace with it. I went home that night. I can remember walking into the room. Sharon was sitting on my right, and the lazy boy, she looked at me, and she had a one-word question for me. She said, well, with a question mark. Well, with a question mark. And I said, we're not going. And I think she almost fell out of the chair. Fortunately, it was a recliner. She couldn't. Because she thought we were going, okay? And so that night, I, I wrote a long email to the two owners explaining exactly what had happened to me, including the stories from Scripture. Why do I share that? Because I don't know of a way for us to cut through this except to have our personal time with God. We have to have a relationship with God. And if we don't have that, Conrad Kanegi just uh, retired from Etown Mennonite Church. This week in his blog, he said he, had, he was a one-sermon preacher, and that one sermon was, you've got to spend time with God. You gotta spend time with God. And uh, I came away from that. Some interesting things I found out after that day. A couple weeks later, one of the guys I work with said, I walked past your office on this date, and he said, I felt God uh, telling me you need to pray for Dale. Isn't that interesting? I, uh, I, uh, 
A week after I lost my job, I had breakfast with two owners from Paradise Energy. I had no idea what they wanted except something. I had dealt with them a couple of years before that. We'd installed a big system with them. And uh, a week later, I, I was working there. Okay. God knew I'm impatient. He didn't let me out of a job very long. And what I didn't know was a year earlier, okay, so, so they didn't take me. I wasn't in a leadership role at all. I worked there six months in, in a uh, uh, financing assistance capacity for customers, and, and I had no management responsibility. It was wonderful. I, I wasn't leading anybody. It was just wonderful, and I thought, this is great. And uh, six months later, one of them called me into his office, and he said, we'd like you to lead the company. And I just about fell out of my chair. It was like, are you kidding me? I don't know anything about this, not compared to what I used to know. And so that took me two months to pray through that. And, uh, and eventually I said yes. And, and, and you know what? I look back on that whole experience, and I, and, and I said, God delivered me from a really bad situation. But at the time, it didn't feel that way. It felt really messy. And, and, and even after I had lost my job officially, it felt messy. What do you do? I mean, the first time in my life I prepared a resume. I'd never done that. It's like, how do you do that? What about us as a church? Who we are as a church is that we are an aggregate of all of us individually. And we've been through some stuff here, haven't we, at Alive? I remember standing out in the parking lot. I shared this at the comm meeting uh, with Metzler, the joint comm meeting the other, the other night. I remember standing out in the parking lot at, down Oak Street talking to Ferris Martin. And Ferris was in the last days of his life. He was dealing with cancer. And I remember him looking at me with tears running down his eyes, uh, down his face, and he said, the best days of effort of Mennonite church are still ahead. That's what he said. We came away from there, and we had all kinds of issues, didn't we? We had building challenges. We had leadership challenges. And we've continued to struggle in a lot of ways as a church. And I remember saying to Sharon for years now that our church is going to get smaller. And now it gets hard. <laughs> this is the hard part. So, a year ago, uh, just a little over a year ago, we were sitting in this church, and we got some bad news, right? We didn't have many worship teams left, and one of them was leaving. We got some bad news, but that Sunday morning, there was something going on. There was something going on. And I went out to the car with Sharon, and we both had had experiences. They were different. God doesn't show up for no reason. A couple weeks later, we were riding home from, from church, and Sharon said, but we've become such a small group now. And I said, I think God has us right where he wants us. Because we can't do it now. Only God can. And what do you see when you look around and you see 450 empty benches? Jeez, what do you see? Do you see the people who have left? Jim described the human population in two ways. We're either following Christ or we could be following Christ. You know, if we look around and we see the people who left, we're living in the past. If we look around and we see what God wants to do with this church, and only he can do it. I don't care even if they come to this church. They can go to another church if they want. I don't care. But the reality is there are people all around us looking for that. Oh, I screwed it up. Hope, life, and love is what's on our website, okay? Hope, life, and love. We offer that. There are people all around us looking for that. I, I run into them in the business world. But look at the next slide. It's kind of hard to read. It says, we invite you to come just as you are 
and be part of a community of people who are seeking together to live out God's purpose and plan for their lives. Whose purpose and plan is it? It's not ours. It's God's. How do we get to this? How do we, how do we work through this? We like to plan, don't we? We throw, we throw ropes under the boat trying to hold the thing together. We, when the storm gets too nasty, we jump on a lifeboat. Paul stayed with it. And as a result, the island of Malta, the people there, many of them became Christians. I don't know. I don't know what God has in, in, in the future of this congregation. But I believe God has it. And we better let him have it. Because if we try and take it back, this place could become empty. We're riding home from church, Sharon and I, after this. And she said, we've become such a small group of people. And I said, I believe that God could be right now preparing a group of people to come to us. Is it Metzler's? People from Metzler's? I don't know. I don't know. But I can tell you this. He brought us Jim White clear out of the blue. We didn't know he was coming. Thank the Lord for Jim White. I mean, he moved in his life. Jim came and he's done a great job for us. And, and so that happened, right? Kind of out of the blue. And then they asked me to go on to, to, to uh, Com as recording secretary. And I really wasn't too interested in it. I thought, ah, we got some choppy days ahead probably. And uh, so I went on, and one of the first meetings, I found out that, oh, there's another church that we're talking to. Hey, I don't, I don't know what's going on, but, but um, it's a crazy time, isn't it? I find it to be exciting. The pandemic has given us a world that is ripe for the gospel, as, as ripe as I've ever seen it. I see people in, our, in the business circle, I, I belong to a convening group, I see people in that convening group who want to belong to a church who don't who are on fire for Jesus right now, and they're uncomfortable in the church. It's really fascinating. I uh, was going to read the lyrics to a song called Hello Unknown, because this really captures what I'm trying to say. I uh, was going to read them, but it's also available in song version. And I've asked Holly whether she can, can uh, put this up there, and we just listen to this song. It's a contemporary song. It's written by Laura's story. If you understand Laura's past... She was, uh, she's had a really challenging journey with her husband. Got married within two years. He had a brain tumor and has had uh, lasting, debilitating effects um, years ago. But songs often come from our hearts, don't they? And I think this one does. And I think it speaks really, really well to uh, what I'm trying to say this morning. So Holly, if you want to roll that. How do we free fall? How do we let go like that for the unknown? I decided to try to tie this in a little bit to uh, Valentine's Day. Ephesians 3, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It sounds almost like the definition of sanctification, doesn't it? If you look in Paul's writings, he over and over again says, dearly loved. Dearly loved. Holy and dearly loved, Colossians 3. Ephesians 2, where our, uh, our own Bible verse basically comes from, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. That's where we got our name from. If we don't get, if we don't get this love thing right, I right, put a Valentine up for you. If we don't get this right, everything else gets goofy. The church in Ephesus in Revelation is condemned. They did everything right except one thing. They lost their first love. Here's the second question. Have you surrendered to God's love? See, he pursues us, doesn't he? And we choose to walk away. 
often. Listen to an interview with Elon Musk. Elon Musk, as far as I know, is not a Christian. I don't judge him. I just don't know that he is. And uh, in 2018, he said, this sounds corny, but love is the answer. And I thought, you know what? For a brilliant man, what an amazing statement. He is not far from the gospel. Because why? We've been created with a hole in our hearts. It needs to be filled with love. And that love is God's love. The best thing that you can do for your spouse my opinion is to understand that God loves you the way you're meant to be loved. And don't expect your spouse to do that. You won't have all your needs met there. You won't have all your needs met in drugs, alcohol, whatever you try and pursue. See, we've got this hole, and only God's love will fill it. And that comes through in Paul's writings. How did Paul ride out that storm and keep his cool? He knew that God loved him. The God whose I am. The God who I belong to. Who do we belong to? Have you surrendered to the love of God? I know of no other, no other way to face this life. There's a lot going on. And there's a lot of people out there who need to know that God loves them. Unconditionally. You see, in the church, a lot of times we come to Christ and we become Christians. And then we, and then, especially those of us who grew up in the church, we fall into the trap of a church culture. We do the right things. That's what the church in Ephesus did. We do the right things. But what about our hearts? Where are our hearts at? You see, when we fall into church culture, we come to church and people say, how are you doing? And we say, fine. And we're not fine. The people that I know that are looking for churches are looking for authenticity and they're looking for uh, vulnerability. And if they don't find those two things, they view us as hypocrites. And that's hard for us, isn't it? Because in the church culture, we think, people look at us and they think, we're pretty good. People look at me and say, you're pretty good. No, I'm not. I still screw up more often than I'd like to admit. I'm grateful for everything that I've not gotten tangled up in. God spared me of that. He gave me godly parents. That's great. But a lot of people don't have that. And we judge them, don't we? It's pretty easy to say, wow, look at at the stuff they've done. It makes us feel good. Wrong. (laughs) Wrong. We need to recognize that we have been forgiven much. In Luke 7, I was going to read it, I'm not going to, we're out of time. But in Luke 7, uh, they bring the the woman to Jesus, uh, or the woman comes to Jesus, and she uh, uh, is weeping at his feet. He's he's in the the house of some some Pharisees, and they say, if you knew what kind of woman that was, you wouldn't tolerate that. She pours perfume on his feet. And he tells them a story about debts, and then he says, Those who have been forgiven much, or those who have been forgiven little, love little. Let me ask you something. How much have you been forgiven? I thought about that. Was Jesus really making a a difference between people who have been forgiven much and people who have forgiven little? Or is it the way we look at it? I look at it and I say, wait a minute. I've, forgiven, I've been forgiven much, but sometimes I act like I've been forgiven little because of how I treat other people. That's me. And that's the challenge I want to leave with you for Valentine's Day. Two questions. Here's your pilot. Have you surrendered to God's love? Let's pray. Father, in the stillness of this moment, we are reminded of your grace that saved a wretch like me. And I still need it because I'm still not perfect. And so in the stillness of this moment, I ask that you remind us of your great love for us. Where every day we get a clean slate. Will you take us by the hand and you lead us? You want to be our pilot and you want us to know that you love us. May we take that with us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name.
Thank you, Dale. Uh, please stand for our closing song. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, the power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When through the woods, and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountains grander and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God is son not sparing, Send him to die, I scarce can take it in. Then on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, when Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then shall I bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. Thank you, Dale, for that challenge. And as you were preaching, I was thinking about bumper stickers that we sometimes see that uh, says, God is my co-pilot. And I think too many times we take that stance, that God is my co-pilot rather than my pilot. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing I thought about was when the 276 people were saved, did the 275 the next day proclaim God as their Savior? We don't know, but uh, we know that, uh, that there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of thinking and, and worshiping God on that island afterwards. So it'd be interesting to know how many of those 175 <laughs> other than Paul proclaimed Christ as your savior. <clears throat> I'm going to s recite the memory verse for you. You don't have to say it. Delmar, you don't need to put it up on the board. I'm going to say the whole verse because it's such a great verse. But It starts out at, from number six. The Lord bless you and keep you 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards your face and give you peace. Now before you go, I actually have a benediction that I thought of for this morning, so you get two today. But this is from Romans 8, and it's from the message. And you'll, you'll recognize this. It's just worded differently. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way Jesus has embraced us. Happy Valentine's Day and enjoy your Sabbath. You're dismissed. <laughs>